This week on the Computer Chronicles, cyber shopping. We'll go over the basics of how to buy stuff online. We'll show you how to use cyber cash to pay for your purchases. Is your credit card number safe out there in cyberspace? We'll look into the security issues surrounding cyber shopping. And we'll show you how online merchants can gather information about you and your buying habits. Plus a visit to the world's largest virtual bookstore and one website that pays you to read their ads. All this and Giles Online, this week's Computer News, my pick of the week, coming up next on the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by SoftSource Incorporated, publishers of Pro One Software, educational software for young adults. And by Upside, the business magazine for the technology elite. Hi, and welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe. You can do a lot on the internet these days, email, research, chats, idle surfing, but one of the most potentially important commercial aspects of the growing web culture is online shopping, the use of the World Wide Web as an infinite global shopping mall. I guess that's the, the thing you discovered, or maybe the gold mine you discovered, I don't know you, Jerry. How serious is this online shopping business? Is this really a, a new serious way for people to buy stuff besides the mall and besides TV? Absolutely. Any new medium like this creates an opportunity for new ways to sell and distribute products and I think the web will be as important to retail distribution as television is. All right, now there's a lot of approaches right now. I mean, some people think, well, you've got to really create this virtual mall, heavy graphics, sort of walk through the mall, walk into the doors. So they're very graphics intensive, but they take forever to navigate, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, what you first see in any new medium is people trying to copy the way things were done in old mediums, in that case a retail uh -huh. store, or another approach you often see on the web is people taking what's essentially a catalog and putting it online in a static form. But those things fail to take advantage of the unique uh, characteristics of the online medium. And I think that what we'll see is uh, the most successful organizations are those that uh, key to those uh, advantages. So like early TV shows or radio shows with exactly. cameras until, you, okay. Show us a couple of examples you have up here uh, or online and you've got some which are kind of graphics intensive and others which go really the more text route, I guess, huh? Right, we just picked out a few examples. Uh, here's one of a virtual mall, uh, the eShop Plaza, where you can navigate through the mall. The, while it's very engaging visually, uh, I think that perhaps it doesn't deliver the information that the particular shopper may need. And more important, a lot of people are accessing these systems over 14-4 modems and other slow systems. It takes too long. It takes too long. Not and, a way to uh, shop. You, you, the, the, the scarce quantity in these systems is the attention of, yeah, the, yeah. of the viewer. All right, now there's another example which is very text-oriented, mm -hmm. which is a lot faster. It's not as snazzy, but you can get stuff done, right? Right, absolutely. This and that's the Internet Mall. Here's an exa another example. The Internet Mall, as you can see from the screen here, it's really very simple. Scroll Just through a bit so we can see the rest uh, of it. Down, down to business, a couple of small graphics, and uh, that's basically it. You uh -huh. know, nice, simple, clean look. Uh, if you were home on your modem, I don't think you have to go get a cup of coffee to right. take a look at something like this. All right, now your business, on sale, you've come up with a kind of unique approach, and you are really running an online auction in which guys like me are bidding against each other to buy stuff, right? Correct. All right, to explain how this works. Well, we run a 24-hour interactive online auction house where we sell it on sale. Uh, refurbished and close out computer gear. Now the fun, what makes that so interesting is that people can bid on these items and their bids immediately appear on the, sc uh, the screen as I'll demonstrate in a moment. Uh, and that allows uh, people to participate in the process of buying, creates a very fun and exciting well, environment. Let's see what it looks like. Okay, well here's our home page and uh, if I uh, just scroll down a little bit, uh, we have something very simple. On the left are categories of goods which are currently up for auction. And on the right are some uh, hot deals. I'll just click here on this uh, NEC multimedia computer. So these are all different auctions going on at the same time over a couple of day period? That's correct. We have about typically 250 to 300 auctions simultaneously, currently over a period of about half a week. Right, so what's going on with this one? Well, here, here we have a computer. Uh, we Minimum bid $100 for an NEC penny? <laughs> That's right. Now, who can resist that? Yeah, right. It's the lure of the bargain that gets people in, and then it's the thrill of the hunt that keeps them there. Uh, we have a minimum bid of $100, a bid increment of $25, and there are 24 of these available. This happens to be scheduled to close next Tuesday. And uh, the next line down says that the last bid occurred uh, just a few minutes ago. Um, and then we have a list of the current high bidders. So and you can see everybody's bid, where they are. Huh. Right, you see the initial city, state. Yeah. Now, bottom economy. line, do I get a good deal or do, or do I pay too much in this auction? No, well, that depends on how shrewd you are as a, <laughs> as a bidder. But in general, you're going to get uh, goods that would sell at retail 
for about 75 to 80 percent of what they sell at retail. But the fun of it is you get to beat out a whole bunch of people who aren't willing and to pay. And the point is, it works. I mean, you told me you're selling what a million bucks worth of stuff a week. That's right. We're doing over a million dollars a week. You're the in QVC sales. of computers. I think that we are to the internet what QVC is to television. All right, thanks, Jerry. All right, now one good example of using an electronic mall effectively is something called Amazon.com. This virtual shop claims to be the world's largest bookstore. Like any other bookshop, this store has shelves, but they are not for browsing. It has a cash register of sorts, but no one is waiting in line to pay. That's because Amazon.com does all of its business over the Internet. And while the surroundings aren't luxurious, the selection is impressive. What makes us different is vast selection, convenience. We deliver right to the desktop, and also the fact that we're the broadest discounters in the world. We discount over 300,000 titles, basically the best-selling titles. And those are, uh, you know, that's twice as many titles as the largest physical bookstore even offers. If our catalog were printed on paper, it would be the size of seven New York City phone books. With over one million titles on hand, the company claims to be the biggest bookshop on Earth, or about six times larger than the biggest physical bookstore. Naturally, there are some twists about buying books over the net. You can't pick up and leaf through an eye-catching volume, but you can search a huge database by author, subject, or with keywords. The company also offers a service called Eyes and Editors. Through email, Amazon will keep you informed of your favorite author's latest work or of new books on a particular subject. People love to shop for books. I love to shop for books, and I like to go to physical bookstores and spend two hours. I like to open the books and just hear the bindings creak. And Amazon.com is never going to have any of that tactical, tactile stuff. We're never going to have any uh, you know, cafes or lattes or anything like that. But we can make Amazon.com Amazon every bit as fun and engaging as a, physical, a good physical bookstore. It's just that it'll be different. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Giles Bateman. Well, there's one overriding issue in online shopping, and that is money. How can you safely buy something and spend money online? One of the solutions these days is something called cyber cash, and that's your baby. What, what is the notion of cyber cash or electronic cash? Why does it make it safer for me to use that when I'm buying something online? Today, most of the shopping online is still done in the clear. What that basically means is that when you enter your payment instrument, a credit card usually, once in a while a checking account, it is transferred unless you are using a service like CyberCash in the clear. That means hackers or anyone Anybody else. Anybody can see my credit card Absolutely. number. Absolutely. So a CyberCash tool encrypts your credit card number or your payment instrument right there on your desktop so that before it travels on the internet, it's turned already into gibberish. So there's a bit of confusion, I think, from the term cyber cash. I mean, I don't literally have cyber cash sort of virtual money out there anywhere, do I? No, you don't. You're using the very same payment instruments that you do in the real world. You're using credit cards, but the only difference here is that they're encrypted before they travel out. Okay, so for ease of use, for ease of understanding, we're calling it cyber cash. It is really encrypted credit card stuff. That's right, and cyber cash is the company plans on offering in the future electronic coin and electronic checks and so cash So we services. might get to that sort of virtual money at some point. That's not it now. That's right. There are other companies, though, such as DigiCash, who are who are providing trials on the Internet yeah. today. All right, let's take a look at how these work. Now, now we're in the CyberCash home site. Now, how would I use CyberCash to buy something? Okay. At the CyberCash home site, you have a list of merchants. And let's look at how one gets to be a merchant. They download something called a cash register, pretty simple, and then they install that. We're going to go and look here at some of the lists of merchants who are providing their items for sale and accepting payments. All right, so I cannot cyber use CyberCash at any online shopping place. It has to be only with a merchant who's using that standard, correct? That's right. Encryption is such an idea uh, that you have to basically have matching ends. So if a consumer has a CyberCash wallet, a consumer can shop safely at these merchants. So we have to be talking the same language here, exactly. CyberCash language. Now, there is another one you mentioned, DigiCash, and let's take a look at their site. Yeah, DigiCash is a company that actually has a different approach than CyberCash to electronic cash. Their motto, as it says right here, is that numbers are money. In the DigiCash approach, 
the money actually stays on the hard disk drive. So that is sort of an, a credit that I get. I sort of spend my spend a thousand bucks and I get a thousand dollars worth of DigiCash sitting Digi in my DigiCash tokens sitting okay. on your hard disk drive. Let's go look at some of the um, banks basically today that are issuing DigiCash dollars, and that is the Mark Twain Bank in the U.S. and in the in Europe, Deutsche Bank is also beginning to trial. So, so how do I do that? I go to the Mark Twain Bank and say, "Here's a thousand dollars. Give me a thousand dollars worth of DigiCash." Yes, these are tokens. These are zeros and ones that sit on your hard disk drive. Uh -huh. So eventually, you get to spend it again at the merchants who accept the DigiCash tokens. And is that really more secure? I mean, can't some hacker steal my zeros and ones then, just the way he could have stolen my credit well, card? Well, in all this, you're basically relying on encryption. Uh -huh. uh, when you use encryption algorithms, and it's CyberCache, it's a thousand plus bits. Um, you are basically assuming that it'll take a hacker a very, very gotcha. long time to decrypt that. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right. Well, there are a lot of complex security issues in this area of online shopping. There is your credit card number, of course, floating out there in cyberspace somewhere. But since the net is two-way, you can gather information on products for sale out there online, but merchants can also possibly gather data on you, too. And that's what I want to talk to you about. You've got VeriSign, Gina. Mm -hmm. And first of all, what, what, what is VeriSign? Is this a way of solving the problem of who are you dealing with online? That's right. Uh, we've heard a lot about encryption and firewalls. Well, there's another aspect to security, which is actually authenticating the identities of people who you're transacting business with. It's important to know, you know, in the physical world, we sit face to face, or we recognize people. I recognize people's, you, and you that's right, or your me. voice over the phone. Yeah. In the online world, we need a similar mechanism for identifying people. All right. So if I go buy something at a, at a website somewhere. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that the guys who say they're running that homepage really are those guys because I'm going to give them some money. That's exactly right. You want to make sure that they're not someone impersonating uh, a website. All right, so this is the notion of digital IDs for both parts mm -hmm. of a transaction. Show me how I would get a digital ID then. Okay. Uh, VeriSign has a digital ID center, which is where you can go to get many different kinds of digital IDs. Digital IDs for end users, if we want to do email mm -hmm. and know who each other is, or if I want to send some information to a bank so that they know who I am. Uh, or for websites that want to identify themselves to their users, or for software publishers who are providing software on the internet. So any two sides of any kind of transaction, they That's really right. want to say, yes, this is really you at the other end of the line, this is really you at the other end of the line. That's right. And so let's take a look at how you get a digital ID mm -hmm. for an end user. Digital IDs are supported in many different kinds of applications. The major browser software, uh, such as uh, Microsoft and Netscape, uh -huh. as well as all the major server providers um, support them. So let's take a look. Uh, right here, you can get a class one or a class two digital so ID. So I'm going to really buy a digital ID from you. That's right. Uh, there's different levels of digital IDs, just like there's different levels of identification forms in your wallet mm -hmm. today. A library card isn't as secure as your passport or driver's license. So digital IDs have different so levels So I pay as well. more, I get a fancier digital ID. <laughs> That's right. Okay. So let's take a look at what it takes to get a class two digital mm -hmm. ID. Here you'll notice this security window popped up. We're using a digital ID ourselves to ensure that you are actually checking in at VeriSign, and all the information that you type into this form will be encrypted. So you feel, can feel safe that uh, we're not that your information isn't passed. Do we clear. have the same standards problem here we had before talking about CyberCache and DigiCache? You've got your digital ID. Somebody has as another standard. Can we get to the point where everybody agrees on what a digital ID is? There, are, there actually is a standard that's already developing for uh, on the web, and that's called SSL, and it's supported by Microsoft and Netscape, Oracle, mm -hmm. IBM. You name it. M most of the companies are supporting it. There's also standards evolving in the email world and in the credit card payments area. So there really is already these standards for digital ID. All right, now show me there's a form I have to fill out to get my digital ID from you, right? That's and right. And you're asking me for a lot of information, and it seems to me that raises yet another security issue that somebody has all this information about me and can, can use it, right? Well, there's two aspects to that. The digital ID itself only contains a little bit of information, and you, the consumer, can determine how much or how little you want to put into your digital ID. There's additional information that you must provide to VeriSign or, or the certificate authority so that they can do the proper investigation to ensure that you are who you say you are. And so that information is protected by VeriSign. Mm -hmm. We have a very large, uh, what we call a certificate practice statement, which, which guarantees to our consumers that we'll protect the information they provide to us. And the rest of the information on the certificate, the consumer controls, yeah. how much goes in the certificate, when they present it, and who they present Still it to. Still a little bit mushy out there. We've got to <laughs> nail this all down. Thank you very much. All right, well, in the Bill Gates book, The Road Ahead, he predicts that advertisers will eventually have to pay you so that you'll look at their online ads. Well, that is already happening at a website called CyberGold. 
It was probably inevitable that the World Wide Web would become Madison Avenue's newest playground, but the shape of advertising on the net is anything but conventional. Cybergold of Berkeley, California has adopted the idea of paying people to read their ads as long as they are the right people. We're making explicit the fact that we value people's attention, just as they themselves value their attention. We believe that people's attention is worth something, and we want to uh, exalt the value of the attention of our members by holding it up to advertisers and say, if you want this, this is something you're going to have to pay for. Anyone can visit the CyberGold site, but to make money, you have to become a member. That entails answering some questions about yourself, from your marital status and income to your shopping habits. The questionnaire provides advertisers enough information to target the right ads to the right people. Portrait Display Labs, a computer monitor distributor, was one of the site's first advertisers. I'm only paying for people who read my ad. It's that simple. If I do direct mail, if I go on TV, yes, I'm going to reach a certain number of people. But with CyberGold, the thing I like about it and the reason that we're making a major part of our uh, program is that it's, it's CyberGold's responsibility to make sure there's plenty of people that might choose to read my ad, but all I've got to do is pay for people who actually do read my ad. CyberGold web ads demand attention, and collecting the gold CyberCoin only comes after members answer a quiz or play a game. It's a big shift in who gets paid and for what. Don't forget, this only works if there's an honest relationship between advertiser and our membership. Our members are really entering into a contract with every advertiser saying, yes, I have paid attention to your ad, and therefore, you must compensate me. We hope that in large measure, they will adhere to that. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Giles Bateman. The internet is radically changing the advertising business. Yes, the net gives you the power to click past an ad, but it also gives the merchant the power to follow you around as you surf the net and gather information about you. One of the leading sites for targeted advertising is called Net Radio, and that's your baby, Robert. First of all, let's set up what is Net Radio? What's the service? We're a network of 10 different music formats and four talk formats where you can come in and personalize or customize based upon your profile and really set up your own one-to-one -one radio network. All right, let's go on and see how we do that now. Now, you're logging in now yes, as, as that, you, Robert. That's correct. And it'll actually recognize the site will come down so and know. welcome, Robert. That knows that it's me. It's got my list of profiles, and it knows the information about me based upon observing where I go, what I do, what news I'm inter interested in, what information I'm interested in. So from the content point of view, it knows what kind of music you like and what right. kind of news you want and what sports scores you want right. and what stocks you want to follow. Right. But it then uses that same information to also figure out what ads it ought to send to you, right? That's correct. That's correct. What we do as a part of the registration profiling system is it asks just very small pieces of information. Mm -hmm. The objective is not to get all the information about you to allow you to remain anonymous, so to speak. And we've got a very uh, strong privacy bill of rights where the users and the information about them in the profile that we collect stays with yeah. us. Well, your name may be anonymous, but it's gathering how you live. That's right. right. It's going through your That's trash right. here and figuring out what kind of guy you are. Right. But you have the opportunity of telling us what your music preferences are, what your news preferences are. Do you like finance news more important right. than regular news versus all the rest? But by knowing those things, we collect psychographic information about you that help the advertising. Right. Now, how do you turn around all this information and run the advertising part of this? Well, we've got a, another little sister application that comes with the website, which is called Net Companion. Mm -hmm which is it's your user interface to dial up and select the streams that you want. And this is the interface where the advertisers now get to cycle through and rotate ads here. At the same time, we've got ads that, if you're in the jazz community, which I know you prefer jazz music, right. we've got ads that will rotate through there based upon certain information. All right, so listen, we've you. got an ad up here right now that just came up, so what, Navarre Corporation, and so th th why did this ad come to you? Um, because these people are in the music business, uh -huh. and they actually are a large distributor and support the retail channel, and, here's a, and here's they're an, able to go here's through. Here's an animation ad, so they know you're I'm a guy who buys floppy disks. I'm a technologist, yeah. that I'm interested in the internet, I'm on the internet, and things like that. Okay, now what's interesting, it's not only picking the kinds of products to show you, but it's also picking the, the way to present the information to you based on the psychographics, isn't it? That's right. Explain we have 
explain that. We have the opportunity of really learning a lot by observing and watching where you go and what you do to even actually find out through the taxonomies and the adjectives that you may be an auditory learner or a visual learner and actually be able to target the message, not only d narrow a cast to you, yeah. but also present it in a way that's most familiar to you. So I'm visual or visually oriented. You can have an ad where I can see something happening versus just a generic powerful ad. but scary yeah. thanks a lot yeah. Robert all right well do you want to use a smart agent to shop for you do you want to find some hot world music want to buy stuff from a shop in Paris but you don't speak French here's our webmaster Giles Bateman and he'll tell you about a couple of cool websites for the advanced online shopper Thanks, Stuart. Although shopping on the internet has not exactly replaced traditional shopping yet, it promises to be very interesting because you can do things electronically that would be difficult, if not impossible, to do otherwise. The online shopping promises to be more than just electronic catalogs. Let's start with Firefly, for example. This is a place where you go and you uh, start telling them a profile of types of music you like. And then as you tell it what type of music you like, Firefly suggests other music you might like. So based on my profile, they've suggested I might like the Beatles. So what I do is I say, uh, yeah, absolutely. They're the best. I really like them. And then Beethoven, yeah, I like that too. Jimi Hendrix, great stuff. Uh, Sugar, I like that. Tchaikovsky, I like that too. And then every time I submit uh, these different entries, they build a better and better profile to suggest music that I might like. Another great thing you can do with uh, shopping on the internet is do sort of a mass version of micro marketing. Here I can go to CD Europe and find uh, compact discs from Europe that I would otherwise have to travel there to buy. Uh, an artist I like, uh, difficult to find in the U.S., is Chris DeBerg. So I'll click on uh, Find It. And what they'll do is they'll bring up all the different items, 98 items found. Uh, We'll scroll down and see what they are. We've got some CDs, some CD singles, even some videotapes. So it may cost us a little bit more than a traditional compact disc, but at least I don't have to travel over there. Now, last but not least, uh, one important aspect of shopping on the Internet is the Internet serves the world. So shopping sites need to be multilingual. Here's an example of one where I can shop in English, or if I happen to be from a French-speaking country, I can shop in French. Thanks, Giles. It's time now for our weekly summary of the latest internet and PC news. Here's this week's Random Access Report with Lori Anderson. In the Random Access file this week, Sun Microsystems introduced its version of the network computer called the Java Station. The stripped-down computer is targeted at the corporate world and will sell for under $1,000. All software and data is stored on large central computers rather than on the individual Java stations. Your kids may be asking for their own notebook computer these days, and Apple has just announced a low-price mobile computer meant just for them. The eMate 300 features a word processor, drawing program, graphing calculator, and built-in calendar. The new notebook also features a touchscreen and built-in infrared technology. It's expected to cost about $800 and be available early next year. And for adults, Apple has announced plans for a handheld Internet computer using Newton technology. Called the MessagePad 2000, the unit includes integrated email and web access, several productivity programs, and features built-in audio recording capabilities. Microsoft continues to seek dominance in the Internet arena. The software giant has announced new software for Internet commerce called Merchant Server 1.0, the software enables companies to establish selling sites with minimal development costs. Well, five major computer companies have jointly launched a new compact disk platform called CD Rewritable. Hewlett Packard, Mitsubishi, Philips, Ricoh, and Sony each took part in the development of this technology, allowing you to read, write, and rewrite data on compact disk. The first products are expected early next year. And finally, police in North Carolina say email messages recently led to the arrest of a murder suspect. Messages recovered from the victim's computer included ones from the accused killer detailing how he would murder her. That's it for this week's news. Back to you, Stuart. Now for my pick of the week. There have been lots of software programs that let you play against the computer in classic card games and board games, but they all miss the social aspects of the game, the kibitzing and the personality of the other players. Oh, it must be beginner's luck. Well, good old Sierra Online has come out with the best ever collection of these games called Hoyle Classic Games. This CD round comes with gin rummy, old maid, bridge, hearts, crazy eights, cribbage, backgammon checkers, and poker. The computer players vary in skill depending on whom you select as your opponent, 
and at the top levels in a complex game like bridge, they play a very good game. But what's best about Hoyle Classic Games is their use of multimedia. In a gin game or a poker game, for example, your opponents actually talk to you. They kibitz. They try to cover up their bluffing or otherwise distract you from concentrating on your cards. I ain't got nothing but ding-dings and rattly bubs. The characters are very well done, and believe me, after playing with some of these virtual opponents for a while, you can develop rather strong feelings for or against them. This is the best and most realistic collection of classic card and board games I've seen yet. And as a bonus, Sierra gives you a simplified floppy disk version for use on laptop computers. The CD is called Hoyle Classic Games. It's available from Sierra Online. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. We'll be back here again next week with more of the best in computers, CD-ROM software, and the Internet. I'm Stuart Chaffe. We'll see you here next time. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by SoftSource Incorporated, publishers of Pro One Software, educational software for young adults. And by Upside, the business magazine for the technology elite. Videotape copies of all Computer Chronicle shows are available for $32.50. Please order by show number and topic. And for more detailed information about the series, guests, and products featured, you can also order a subscription to the Chaffee Letter. In each issue, Stewart provides his unique insights and thoughts about the fast-changing world of personal technology. Videotapes and the Chaffee Letter can be ordered by calling 1-800-800-9520 or by writing us at the Computer Chronicles. For more information on anything you've seen on today's program, check out our website at www.pctv.com.